I think it's important for you to know how Al and I met. I'm a paratrooper, 26 years in the Army. I walked into the library, uh, lobby one day, and I see this little guy standing at the window wearing a backpack, and he has an 82nd Airborne patch. 82nd Airborne, Fort Bragg, North Carolina. I went through Special Forces training at Fort Bragg, North Carolina, and I'm also a paratrooper. So immediately we had something in common. We started talking, and Al says, you know, for 50 years I've been looking for a photograph. He said, when I went out of the airplane, I had trouble with my main chute, so I pulled my reserve. And I looked down, and there was a guy down on the ground taking pictures. He said, I'd like to find one of those photographs. And he says, I'll be easy to spot. Because he said, out of the whole group that jumped out of the airplane, I'm the only one coming down with both chutes. And I said, Al, I know where that photograph is. And I immediately went to the photograph, as you see here in the front. That's Al jumping out of the airplane. 1952, code name Charlie. The 82nd Airborne Division parachuted into Ground Zero. And Al and I have been friends ever since. And each time that we have an event, uh, Al lives in Hawaii, all we have to do is call him. Because he knows he has a family here at the museum in Las Vegas. So at this time, I'd like to introduce Al Sue. Al. Thank you, Steve. First of all, I want to thank everyone to, to uh, be out here. And more than anything, I want to thank my family and a friend that's here. And I want them to stand up, please. And I want, yes. Thank you. Yeah, all of you guys stand up one time. Just, these, these are my family. And I'm so grateful that they, they've come from long ways. Okay. Yeah, they. One of my son was in Alaska, came here. My daughter from Utah, they're here. My friend, Sue, also came from Utah. But I'm so grateful to be here, so grateful, and, and also humbled. I haven't planned on anything to talk about, so in conclusion, no. <laughs> no, I, I haven't planned anything really, but I want to speak from the heart. That's the only way I know how to do, speak from the heart. What, is, what I've experienced, I'm so grateful for. This wonderful country I love so much. I'm in love with this country more and more every day of my life. Now, I want to say that you could ask, ask me any question you want to, okay? There's no question I won't answer, so I want to say what I had in my mind, and then later, if you have any question, I welcome it. I will answer any question. I, of course, searched my mind on what I should say, but I think the most important is that I'm so honored to be part of this atomic uh, testing thing that's going on in, uh, here in Las Vegas. We just came out of a uh, you know, maneuver. See, the 82nd Airborne trains all the time. All the time. We, we don't stay in a, in a barracks or, or just, you know, it's like a basic training for the entire time that I was there. We train in, in desert, we train in snow. In fact, we just came back from a, a, a uh, snow training at uh, New York, the coldest spot in the world, where it's about 26 below zero most of the time. And uh, we, we live in a tent. We go across country in skis and learn how to ski and 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 uh, sh show snow uh, snowshoeing. Yeah, I'm not familiar with snow, but I love the snow. It's cold. I like cold weather. Anyway, we just came back from a uh, maneuver, and that was up in the mountains of Andy Rondike. Is that New York? Is that correct? Am I saying it correctly? Andy Rondike. 
all the Adirondack, the cold spot. It's colder than in Alaska because we're supposed to go to Alaska for training, but they say it wasn't cold enough. So we just came back, then we heard that we're supposed to come here to get our the atomic bomb testing. And we were told that the, the bomb would be about twice the size of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, twice the size. And it was 31, kil, uh, 31 kiloton, is that what it is? 31 kiloton, uh, more than any, uh, anyway. So we were in a foxhole, and it was not very deep. I said, we'd say about four or three and a half feet deep, three miles from ground zero when the bomb was dropped by airplane. I didn't know it was dropped by airplane, but it was. And um, we were there a few minutes later. They say, okay, go down because we're going to start the countdown. Then I hear 10, 9, 8, and then down to zero. And all of a sudden, the, the, uh, the explosion, the biggest firecracker I've ever heard. It really was as loud as could be. And then the heat came over us. Even though we we're on the ground, they, you, could, you could feel the heat on our body. We had no, nothing. We were facing away from the bomb. They told us to face away from the bomb. And so it was so hot. It's like opening the oven door after you bake some cookies, you know? You open the door and, you've, and the heat comes out. It just bathed the whole, whole body. And then we turn around, and they say, okay, go into the trucks. We're going to take it down the airstrip. And so we went down the airstrip, put on a parachute. There were maybe a dozen or more planes there. We put on our parachute and with a battle gear, and we boarded the plane. I think the time difference between the bomb that was exploded and the time we boarded the plane was about, I would say, a little over a half an hour. And we got into the plane, and we circled around until the plane was in formation. We had to drop 300 men at one time. And, um, but you know something? You know, we, at that age, let me, well, let me go back a little bit. The highest I've ever been in, and we never rode airplanes before. Because back in the 30s and 40s, nobody traveled by airplane. I'm sure those about my age will understand that. We go by bus, train. I never flew an airplane in all my life until we got through airborne training. But 90% of these young men from Kansas, Iowa, Kentucky, or whatever small town, never been in an airplane. And the highest I've ever been was on a mango tree. Yeah, really is the highest. So we, of course, you know, we got through airborne training, got our wings and everything, and we make regular jumps. But that day when we jumped, funny, you know, there was no fear because kids, you know, I was only, what, 22 at the time, very young. It was, we were so excited, so excited. And uh, we didn't think anything about the A-bomb, the effects, the radiation. It was there. It was there. But we didn't think of that. So I was the third man out of the, the lead plane. So we bailed out, and, um, and I noticed, see, usually that parachute, when, we, when it opens, it has a tremendous shock. Oh, because these were the T-7s. Now, how many of you ever jumped from a T-7? These are the Second World War shooting. I just want to know, if you, because I don't think so, because it's so back in the days of the Second World War type of parachute. We, we use the old equipment. Anyway, it opened so loud and with a shock that it just, it shakes you up. But that time it didn't happen. We, um, we jumped, I mean, I, we jumped out and I, and I was calling up 1,000, 2,000. At that 3,000, the, the chute would have been pulled open. And I didn't feel anything, so I thought something was wrong. And see, from the time you leave the plane to you hit the ground, if you don't have to pull the parachute, it's eight seconds and you're gone. Eight seconds and lights out. But I think it was four or five seconds. I noticed that there was no shock, no, no, the parachute didn't open properly. It came out, but was, you know, they call it the May West. Now, May West have many May Wests, all degrees of, 
uh, malfunction of the, uh, May and that was my second uh, experience with the Mae West. The first one I was able to, you know, correct it, it was okay. This one was the worst I've ever been in. So I looked up and the parachute was just tangled up in those lines, the shroud line, we call it shroud lines. So I had just a few seconds, I pulled the reserve and I tried to hold on to it just for a split second and I threw it as far as I can because if you just pull it and it comes straight out, it'll be caught by the second, the first parachute, the main chute, it'll, it'll, it'll tangle it, you know. It has happened so common when they pull the reserve and the reserve goes up, the chute that didn't open but just dangling would just whip and tie it up and then you have no parachute. And so I did that, I threw it far and it bloomed open. That's why I got two parachutes, no, well, anyway, let's put it this way. Then I, then I fixed the main chute, I climbed the riser as high as I can and I tried to flip that cord, the shroud line, over the, the parachute that was tangled. It worked. And so, because my parent, the first, you know, maybe was I had, I, I couldn't do that. I, well, maybe I was a little too, too tense, I didn't, uh, but I, for this one, this time I climbed it. I just had to get it out. And so anyway, when I landed, I noticed there was a photographer. Of course, I hoped, I sure like to see him because he was there taking a picture of me and I landed. We had all our rifles and things of that sort, you know, combat equipment. And I landed and he just kept zeroing in on me. And I landed and I put my rifle together and I looked up and said, I said, wow, I didn't expect anybody down there waiting for us, you know? And he said, I said, what are you doing down here? He said, never mind, soldier. Get on what you're doing because I'm taking pictures, you know. So, so I, uh, we got our rifle together. And where I landed, where all these animals were, you have these uh, sheep, goats, pigs, uh, oh, so many different animals. They were in um, those cages, uh, wire, so you can see through it. And uh, you would see the animals' eyes were just shot out. You have the... Uh, I mean, you can't. Well, actually, they were blind. They were blind, because they can't see anything. You know, I had, I saw. I remember seeing the sheep looking at me, and uh, but I know he was. He didn't see anything, because there's no pupil, just just the bloodshot, now completely red. And so I um, looked at the other sheep, but we took off. We had to get out of there. And um, no. By the way, if you have any questions, stop me, because then. Like the answer I give would be, you know, relative to what you want to know. So I have no problem with answering questions. Yes. So you were instructed to, to you parachute into the middle of uh, to the middle of ground zero. Now, what were you told could possibly happen? To no, they don't say anything. With, you know, they never did it again because that they never drop parachute anymore. I mean, paratroopers anymore in that ground zero. And they never explained why, but you know, throughout the years, I mean, you know, we went back, and I understand that they were trying to train us to go to Russia, probably, because we had ski training prior to that, very intensive snow, cold weather training. Then we got to this A bomb. At that time, they were in a Cold War. Remember that in, in the uh, early fifties, or f even late forties after the war, there were a lot of threats between Russia. Then there was the uh, war in Korea. And uh, so, the, so the Russians were really, now I hope I answer your question. Okay, the uh, Russian was, I'm sure they were watching the 82nd Airborne because we were the quick strike outfit. We can, land, we can be out of there in Fort Bragg into Russia within just hours and we'd be there. So the A-bomb was, I think, part of that. But we never talked about it. It was part of that uh, training. So, um, yeah, we dropped right into the ground zero, and I'm sure that it, the atmosphere was laced with uh, nuclear. Things. It was laced, I'm sure. I mean, you know, why, why would it not be? You know, and just half an hour, 45 minutes later. But they didn't know the, uh, the, uh, the results or what. Okay, yes. Was it a surface burst or was it a low altitude burst? It was a low altitude burst because uh, they dropped the thing by. You know, we never seen anything drop because they told us to turn away and not look at it. And it exploded maybe, oh, five, six hundred feet, and it just spread out. So, but prior to that uh, type of test that we're take, we're, we took, uh, the troops were about 10 miles away, and then they got closer to five miles, and then three miles. 
and then of course dropping paratroopers into the into the uh, atmosphere and um, so to answer your question again no they didn't know what to expect but i mean well, it's just not safe i'm sure but anyway we got out of the place and got it to way out of the perimeter and then I, we saw some scientists with some white coats like you both, some of you have on. And uh, they had Geiger counters. I think there were about a, a dozen or so of these people lined up. And we went across and they run that Geiger counter over ourselves. And the thing was off the chart. And I remember uh, asking the guys, hey, what's that stuff going buzzing around? He said, never mind. <laughs> never mind. <laughs> <laughs> Never mind. I don't know. But you know, that's a long time ago, 50, 1952. How many years ago? 63 years ago? That's a long time. So I, yes, but I don't forget anything, yes. What aircraft did you jump out of? Okay, yeah, we jumped out of the older aircraft. Craft. I know it's not a, it wasn't a C-47, because I know C-47 has only one door. And it was a C-46. C-46, it had two doors. And uh, so, yeah, it was a C-46. Both doors, I mean, both, doors, both people just get out of the plane real quick. Yeah, it, it, because you have to. Otherwise, you would pass the drop zone. We have only just seconds to get over the drop zone and drop them in. So there's no holding back. Yeah, any question? Is that answering your question? Does it answer your question? C-47? The C-46, rather, that we jumped off. I thought maybe we jumped out of the C-119. Yeah, well, the C-119 was... Box yeah, well, that we jumped off, uh, I, would, I would say, three-fourths of the time or more. Yeah. C-46 was pretty common. They were, they were the workhorse. Yeah. Yes? Why were those animals alive still? It sounds like you saw yeah, well, some were, some were not even moving, but when they moved, they were, they, they, they were, they were all burnt, but it's, it's a different kind of burn. I thought you would see black, you know, but they were just like they were, you, you, you colored them with a, a uh, red dye. It was, it was like pink and red because they shaved the hair off, you know, that's, so, so that we can see what's going on, that they know they didn't, they weren't burnt black or toasted, but the radiation just did all of that oh, to it. Okay, yes. What was the purpose of jumping with uh, weapons? You said you jumped with rifles. Oh yeah, well, all the jumps we make is always with rifles because, uh, in fact, BAR, the those the heavy equipment. Now we I pack it with us. Uh, I mean, you know, we don't just to jump without those weapons, everything, canteen, seal helmet, bayonet, everything. And because we have to be combat ready, we have to know what it feels like to jump with equipments. And so those are part of us, this is part of our equipment. Yes? Just a comment, I think that that uh, this is a, uh, was a tactical uh, effort in those days. Uh, there, were, there was a school of thought that says, look, if you have an airburst, you can jump in and occupy the territory right away. And I think this was an effort to demonstrate yeah. that we found the fact that the radiation environment still is extremely hazardous. I think that's what happened. No, no, you're absolutely right. We came to the conclusion uh, that it was exactly what it is. Because we were the quick strike off at one of the very few, the 82nd Airborne is, a, is the only unit that can go over to Russia in just hours. And the Russians were watching us. They, they, and so that was to put a fear in them that we have the capacity, the ability to hit them. Right in, in the capital if it's necessary. Well, that was a Cold War at that time. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Okay, well, would you repeat that question a little louder, please, so we all can hear it? I was wondering if you could plague by any sort of cancers that were a direct result of their... Plague by... Cancers. Cancer? Well, there's no question about it, because I don't see any of my buddies over here. Because there were 300 of us, and I know him. I mean, I know them. And if they're here, I would love to see them. I've got a lot of good friends. And I kept in touch with them. 
And uh, I know several wrote to me and said, Al, you know, I don't think I'm gonna have much longer to live. Thyroid cancer, uh, different type of cancer. And so the, there was just nobody left except me. I don't know why, you know. Um, I guess if it doesn't kill you, it'll preserve you, huh? Yeah. <laughs> No, really. Do you remember what month uh, of, uh, of the year you, you made the parachute? Oh, yeah. I remember the day, the hour, and everything. <laughs> it was April the 22nd, 1952. That has to be Charlie Shaw. I'm sorry. Charlie. Yeah, well, yeah, we didn't know it was Charlie, but okay. Yeah, it's Charlie. Okay. And it was in Area 7 of the Nevada test site. Uh -huh. And it was, a, uh, it was an airdrop, like you said. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to help you out, sir. Thank you, thank you. I appreciate that because we only, you know, grunts. We don't know much. But there were 31 kilotons. Was that? Uh, Charlie uh, was um, 31 kilotons. Yeah, 31, right? 31. Okay, 31 kilograms. And that, and what's the other one? The other kilogram, the kiloton uh, that was dropped. I mean. Well, we had. As a comparison, we had, we had April, uh, April shot. In April of well, one of six, 52, we had the Baker shot, 4:15:52, uh, and then you were involved in the Charlie shot, April 22, 1952. The previous ones were one kiloton, one kiloton prior to you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you very much for letting me help you. Yeah. <laughs> I thank you. <laughs> yeah. So, so that's all I can say uh, except that you know I. I just thought it was a great privilege to be part of this test, real privilege. And, and this is the greatest country in the world. Because America is, is all that I know of. You see, I'm, my racial attraction is Chinese, but I was, I was raised in Hawaii my father fought in the First World War as an infantryman in France in 1917. And um, he had four sons, and he told us this at the beginning of World War II. I was about 10, 12 years old at the time. He says, uh, none of my sons will be drafted. I remember him saying that. None of my sons will be drafted. Well, does it mean that we're going to take off in Canada? <laughs> no. You're going to volunteer. So my brother volunteered in the Navy in the Second World War when it broke out. I was a little too young yet. Then the Korean War started uh, in June of uh, 24, And I went in the following day. But I went to go to, but <laughs> to take you back a little bit, I've always wanted to be in the airborne. See, we were, when I was a kid, 1941, 40, up to 45, when the war ended, we were shiny shoe, we were you know, shoe shine boys, you know, petrol, well, shiny shoe. We saw a lot of service personnel, five different branches, concentrated in Hawaii, going overseas to fight, because Hawaii was the conduit, the transfer point. And I saw Marines, Army, Navy, Coast Guard, Air Force, but I noticed the paratroopers were the sharpest guys. You know, yeah, really. Yeah. And they had boots on that I like, ooh, that's nice boots. And they all seemed to be respected by other branches of service. And so, I mean, I saw them from far, and I said, well, there's, there's, there's something that I want to be in. They're very special. They wore those boots, you know. So I wanted that. So when I came out of high school, that's what I want to be. So I joined the, uh, joined the airborne. But you have to pass the test, physical test, agility, and all that, score points. And so I was able to get in there. And it was a very special time. I, so, so I volunteered into the Army. My brother was Navy. Then my two younger brothers uh, volunteered shortly thereafter, Air Force and Marines. So you have four branches, Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines. So my father had four boys that just signed up for, for the you know, military when the time came that our country needed us. And I say this again, I, I'm not, I don't want to be political, but America is the greatest country in the world. God has a purpose for us. Imagine 
a country that, I mean, a continent that is in the middle of two oceans it was kept and preserved for special people. People that wanted religious liberty, political liberty, economic liberty, social liberty, they came to America. There was one common language they spoke, and that was English. Why would America be chosen a special nation? Why couldn't they have gone to Europe? It was already settled. There were people that are, uh, but the difference, this is my thinking now, they were divided. Their language was divided. Their, their method of political, well, you know, in the scriptures, he says this, in the scriptures, now I don't want to go too far into it, but Christ said you cannot pour good wine into a old bottle. Now, bottle back then was the leather that you hold the wine. That, but they call it bottle, but they were leather. So you cannot pour good wine into an old bottle because what happened, the bottle would not hold up very long. So you put good wine into a new bottle, and America was the new bottle, the new, the new uh, bottle. So he has to get started. You see, God's way is not man's way, nor his thoughts, our thoughts. He sees the end in the beginning. He knows. Now, of course, now America is not always perfect. But we, every time we go to war, we go to war to defend a country that needs our help. France, First World War, they called America one, to, to come and rescue them. Second war, same thing. And so I don't say America is perfect. We have a problem. But we are the best country in the world. We help people out. After the war, what happened? Germany became a great economic country. Look at Japan. They became a great country after the war. They were our enemies. But America was a very gracious and, and generous country. We, we lift them up. If it wasn't because of our, our Christian values, yes, but because everything is based on the Constitution, which was based on God. Look at Korea. We went there to fight, but did we occupy them? Did we take advantage of them? No, we gave them back, and we gave them back better than they were before. What country have done that? I, I, I can't think of any. Even the British, I hope I don't hurt anybody's feeling, but when the British took over, they, they took up the resources, Indonesia, you know, and, the, and whatever resource they have. But America doesn't do that. We give them back and become a better country. So that's why the older I get, the more I'm in love with this country. I, I, I know that we, are, we have a divine destiny. And we are in that plan. So this is why this country is so blessed. Does anybody have a question you have, Judge? Yeah, I was um, sorry to take off from that. You speak louder so people can hear. Yeah, I want to go back to when we were, when you did your jump and when you were preparing. Did they give you any kind of equipment to wear to protect you, or I mean, did they just say, "Go in, good luck, goodbye"? <laughs> Probably goodbye. <laughs> no, they didn't say anything. No, nothing. No special uh, protective gear. No. Protect? Oh no, no protective gear. No zero. No, because they, I think maybe behind that is to wonder maybe how much we can take, how much radiation we can have. You know, some didn't take the radiation very well, but I might have taken it pretty good. Yes. Was there any follow-up medical uh, examination of, of you and your people over a period of months or? even a year or so after the shot? Good question. Good question. I glad you, This is why I like to open up to questions. The follow-up was after, I think, 10 or 15 years later, maybe 10 years, the, the atomic, um, I don't know what you call atomic energy department, uh, they sent us a letter and asked us, how are we doing? Uh, how's your health? Who's your doctor? Uh, how many children do you have? Um, and, 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 you know, all these health questions, I think there were something like 30 pages. I don't remember, but I had to ask a lot of questions. 
I'm with 30 questions rather, yeah. And so when I answered it, um, they asked for comments, you know, in the bottom. I said, well, actually, I was very healthy. You know, I was doing well, I, was, I had family. And, but I said, the only thing I noticed that may be wrong is that my children, uh, you know, I check on them at nights, I, and I noticed they kind of glow. <laughs> <laughs> and that's all I said. They glow a little bit. <laughs> but I never heard front by back from them anymore. They know that guy's that guy crazy. He's trying to pull a, yeah, but so. Um, your glow stick. Yeah. No, but no, I don't know why, but I, I'm okay. Because I'm, right now, I'm on my 80, going on my 85th year of life, living. <laughs> yeah, thank you. You know, that bomb could kill you. I tell my friends that when they ask, why am I still alive? Or oh, it can preserve you. So it must have preserved me because I feel okay. <laughs> you know? But I know I'm getting older. You know why? I get letters from um, the uh, care homes. They say, we got a good place for you know, <laughs> older people. You know, and it's very, all the doctors are there. And I said, well, why would they send it to me? I guess I was getting old. And then the next thing you know, I got letters that's from the uh, you know, funeral parlor. Reserve your place now. You know. <laughs> I said, and that's getting close. You know? And so I just, uh, but I am getting older in years, but I don't feel a day over 100. Uh, yeah, I feel great. I really do. And I, and I owe that to, I guess, to my... Uh, I had good genes, but I have to take care of myself, so I take care of myself. And, and so, but, but, I, but the bottom line is this, I just love this country. Uh, it's who I am. If there's a war between China and America, I'm on this side here, the fence. Yeah, I'm on this side, yeah. yeah there's a question? Yes. My husband was in the trenches between 51 and 53. Your son? Oh, yes, yes. But okay. He didn't look that old. Because I don't think anybody went through that bombed area afterwards. They just were there as witness of the bomb, as uh, you know, as a show, and then they they finished. But we, went, like your husband and I, we went through the ground, and we picked up all these things, those the things that they're uh, curious about first first hand. Thank you for now. Did you all hear the question? I mean, the comment. Yeah, yeah. There were not too many that went through the. Uh, you know, through the bomb, ground zero. Right. Yeah, no, not, 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 not many, not many. But, you know, but that's, that's all I have. If there are any other questions, I'd be happy, happy to answer for you. But I'm just so thankful to be able to take part of this test. Thank you very much. <laughs>